So we will we move for the most most exciting part probably. So the, the interactive part. So we welcome you back on stage, as well as we do Mr. Birkert's, uh, Klaus, Peter, and Jan. And it's my pleasure to welcome and to pass my microphone uh, to Kate Russell, who some of you might recognize from BBC BBC show Click, where she does. Uh, Webscape segment, and I definitely recommend you to check out her book on clouds, on computing services, how they can be used. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here speaking to you today. So, um, thank you very much to Ed Lieber for inviting me. Um, I am a technology journalist and reporter, but um, yeah, I'm also an author, and I've, uh, I've actually got two books out, uh, the second one being a science fiction novel that was released last year. So, you know, these subjects and, and hearing all of you speakers here today, um, you know, really resonates with me and actually means a lot to me because it's not really a topic that I've thought about that much. But actually, I really should have done um, because reading and storytelling and the enjoyment of it has been really core to who I've become today. Um, and when I got the preparation, preparation materials for today's discussion, um, you know, I was shocked and somewhat confused by the statistic uh, which we heard this morning, which is that, you know, still one in five um, uh, people in Europe don't have literary skills and the ability to read and write to the level that gave me so much joy and development growing up. And it really confuses me because, you know, my life was really sort of brought alive by books. I remember my first uh, book that I read independently, Charlotte's Web. Um, you know, and as well as transporting me to uh, a fantastical world, it also taught me an awful lot about, you know, the experiences that I was going to have as I was growing up, about friendship and about death, you know, and all of these really difficult topics which we have to deal with through life. And I began to learn them through my relationship with stories um, and books. So I'm really excited to expand a little more on the topics that we've already heard all of our wonderful speakers today talk about. Um, I would also like to invite the audience um, both here in the uh, auditorium and also those of you watching on the live stream, as I know um, a few are. If you have any questions, this is the interactive part of the, uh, of, of, of the day. If you have any questions, then we'd really love to hear them. And you at home can uh, send your questions in by using the hashtag EdLieber2015. Um, and um, there'll be people down here who will be keeping an eye on that and will feed those questions to me as and when um, you have them. So if you, any of you in the audience, if you have a burning question, just I'll keep glancing out to the audience. Just put your hand up and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and you can, uh, you can begin, um, uh, you, you can ask your question, pose it to our panel. Um, but first of all, I would like my esteemed panel to perhaps go through and just, just really, um, if we could start with you, Sven, and then work down, if you could just really just remind the audience who you are in case those watching at home um, missed the earlier sessions. Um, and maybe give me your top line of what you think the important issues that we need to be discussing in this session, which is dealing with how do we make a Europe of readers? Sven. Okay. That's a tall order for a short period. I am a, uh, originally a bookseller and then a critic and an editor of a literary journal, and I teach writing, so my interests never been, I'm not a librarian, but I've been in and around and near libraries and books forever. I resolved not to prepare a statement for up here, but to try to listen to what was being said this morning and to make some kind of responsive comment. And it struck me over and over that um, to some degree it seems that one of the many actions that we have to think about in terms of the library is also to be open to redefining, but also holding certain lines. Because what I'm hearing on the one hand is the ancient, long established tradition of what libraries were, and it was always referring in a sense to this abstract but definite entity called a cultural life. And what I'm hearing a lot about, and I think it has to do with um, problems with literacy and a certain sense of a library now needs to retool and struggle for a new kind of role is that there's a great deal of discussion about libraries becoming um, 
instrumental social use centers where people can go to look for employment. Uh, I think a lot of discussion has been about reading in many different ways, but not necessarily the kind of reading that used to be specifically um, culturally defining. But this is, you know, reading everything from, um, you know, digital video information as a kind of reading to fan fiction to this and that. And I just want to propose that I think part of the whole ongoing task and discussion of the place and purpose of a library is to still try to as negotiate or establish whether there is also within all of this a certain ongoing service to something that we still identify as a um, culture, a serious culture that the library traditionally has been in service of while still acknowledging that it's going to have many, many uses that are far more social, practical, and uh, invite a community into a space. And does that necessarily make it a library if people are in using computers to find jobs? Are they still really using a library, or are they just using a convenient access point for uh, the use of computing skills. So that would be my opening take. Perfect. Thank you very much. And um, Jan, we'll move on to you. Obviously, you know, we heard you speak a lot about e-books e and the nature of e-reading. Um, if you could give us your sort of like summary of, of, of what you feel are the important issues now, that would be great. Yes, I'm representing those people in Europe who are responsible for public library policies throughout uh, Europe. So, uh, and we have a lot of discussions on what public libraries should do and what how we could help them to, to establish, to adapt to a new environment. And I, was, I am really quite challenged by what you were saying, you know, the last uh, speaker. And um, I, I only have six points I want to, to mention. Uh, I know you won't remember the six points, of course. But it's a kind of report of the discussions of the Naples group uh, yesterday. And I like to bring it in and to challenge you to see whether there are more or less um, an answer or uh, um, they connect to your ideas and your research uh, results uh, but we will see you yeah. so we, we said yesterday to each other there are six important things well it's my resume of, of uh, debates uh, yesterday it's public libraries have to they have to focus on young people and their families uh, both of them so, um, public libraries they um, should know that the cultural background of their families differs and is differing more and more. So that's about the multicultural, hyper-multicultural society. They should cooperate with other partners, especially educational organizations and learning organizations. Uh, they should take advantage of the fact that libraries, and really this is a, 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 what you already mentioned, that libraries are more and more used as an essential physical place a space by the local community, by young people. So they are coming to libraries, start working with them, and see that how important that space, that local space is, uh, what a li uh, public library is. They should deliver services to people uh, also outside of the library. So they should connect and reach out to people outside, uh, in their homes, online, in homes of elderly people, in hospitals, etc. And the last thing is, well, the, there were things I think you said was, uh, that connect to this one. Uh, people have passions. And they want to become someone, they want to be someone, and we should help people make the association be, be, between their ambitions and the practice of uh, finding information and the practice of reading. So make a connection between those two things. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. And, and that, that strategically placed chair with nobody in it wasn't to keep these two apart, but Davina, we've just heard from you. Um, so if you could sort of, you know, just maybe, um, you know, perhaps respond a little bit from, from your perspective to um, Jan's point. So, I mean, would you, would you sort of class yourselves as perhaps, the, perhaps a more traditionalist and a transformatist? Is this kind of, you know, would that be a, a fair assessment of the, of the differences between your, your positions? Well, the first difference is that I'm not a librarian. So, <laughs> and I really don't claim to be one. I, I love librarians, but I, I really haven't been trained. So um, I'm more a user and uh, 
like many of you, I have my own history that brings me to libraries. My history is a, is a history of um, an illiterate background and an immigrant background of parents who were Republicans in Catalonia, moved to Morocco and then moved to France, moved to France with their libraries. The only book I, we had at home was a um, um, dictionary, which I knew inside out and back and forth. And the first books I had were given to me when I was nine, and I inherited, in fact, <clears throat> the little library of a boy. So I was lucky enough in my childhood not to read La Bibliothèque Rose, but to read La Bibliothèque Verte, which was much more interesting and much more um, adventurous. Uh, and in Corsica, where I was living, uh, the library was empty. It was the li library of Cardinal Fesch, beautiful wood, mahogany, etc. Empty with three librarians. And the day I crossed that threshold, they embraced me. And so what I got as libraries in Corsica were there that there were places for the elite, where nobody went, where knowledge was locked. And if you had the key, or if you met the right person, knowledge was unlocked. So my position about libraries is that they are pro-migrants, pro-poor, non-elite, pro-popular culture, and therefore should be opened. And this is the activist, not just the sociologist. Young people consider them like this, and I think we should encourage that, even if they're not poor and migrants. They should feel libraries are places they can go in, sit down, lie down, whatever, as long as they get into the threshold of knowledge and information. After that, things will happen. Migrants meet, or other migrants meet very well-acculturated people. I'm a very well-acculturated French person because in libraries later in my life, I met very different kinds of people. I wasn't just reading there, it's a social experience. And thinking that it's an experience that can only happen alone, uh, I think, is not embracing the whole opportunities of libraries. Yes, there should be spaces where you can isolate yourself in a little booth and a cocoon, and there should be places where you just completely open up to, to the world. So it's this double respiration that all libraries have to get now. It's this double message that they have to, to send now. Not just an image that we are repositories for smelly, dusty old books, however interesting they are. However interesting they are. We never have access as readers to the, those places where these old books are stored. Why not open up all of that? So this is what I would say. Thank you very much, Davina. Okay, so, uh, I mean, um, uh, Klaus Peter Butka, you are the outgoing uh, president of EBLIDA. Um, so, um, what have you taken, or, you know, I mean, we heard you speak very early this morning, um, but perhaps people watching online didn't hear you speak. Can you give us your top line, and what have you taken from, you know, what you've heard just coming down the panel here? What do you think are the important issues for our goal of getting more people in Europe reading? Well, I... I'm a little bit in doubt. I think I have two problems. Uh, the problem of the role of the librarians. Um, we are here in a circle with representatives of associations, very conscious of what is happening on the European level, happening on the changes of users and um, uh, uh, probably um, a modern function of the, of the public library. But I'm a little bit afraid that in my 15 branches, not all librarians are conscious of all these developments, what it means to their daily work, to their programs. So for my, uh, I think um, it is very important, no, just a sentence before. Um, and the, the, the second remark is, of course, I'm, I'm very shocked by these statistics, if I look into my neighborhood and have to think that some of the neighbors are not able to read and write, who are they? Who can I reach them? And, and these, um, these uh, reaching and the tr to try to, to find an approach, I think it is necessary to, to create national programs. Also a little bit to force libraries and librarians to, to experiment, to, um, to find solutions for uh, 
um, getting those those people who are um, well who will probably get lost lost not only by the libraries but in the society and on the, on the market. Absolutely. I mean, you know, probably one of the biggest problems that we've got in discussing this, you know, as a, an association of, of libra librarians and people who work within libraries, is you're very unlikely to come in contact with the, with the people who don't read, <laughs> right, just by the nature of the job. So, you know, how do we get that connection together? You know, it's been really interesting for me actually listening to how many personal stories there are this morning about how, you know, how reading and how literacy is connected, you know, resonated with people's lives. Um, can I ask all of our panel, do you remember your first book? Yeah, maybe we'll start with you, Davina, on that one. Do you, do you remember the first book you read independently? Not had read to you, but you, you actually read the pages mm -hmm. and turned the pages? Michel Strogoff. <laughs> the Adventures of Michel Strogoff. <laughs> and, and, and the rest of our panel? And, uh, who, uh, Sven? For me, it was the Jungle Book, and I remember the first sentence, the transformation from looking at these ciphers, and then the moment that came when they suddenly magically converted into something I recognized as sense. I don't know how far I went into the book, but I remember sitting there and reading and looking at that page and having it open up sort of in technicolor, verbal technicolor, so. Can I ask Peter, how about you? Do you remember your first book and what, what did that do for you? Um, I don't know if it was Karl May and um, getting into a non-existing America, or was it any Blyton where um, my librarian just allowed to take only once, although it was, uh, at that time, a maximum of three lending, uh, three books to lend, and maximum one in it Blyton. <laughs> yeah, and maybe you could answer the question and then perhaps expand on from that to um, answer the first question I want to put to the panel generally, which is, do you think that we are, are we losing the art of storytelling in the modern digital world, or is it still as powerful an experience for, for, for young people that might get them interested in reading? But first, what was your first, do you remember your first uh, book that you read? I, I do remember the experience of reading that book, although I couldn't read at the time. Uh, it was a gift from my godfather. It was an illustrated children's book. I don't remember the title. I don't remember the author. It was a translation from an English book because it had all the, the atmosphere of London in it. Uh, but it was, a, it was a very important book because I'm coming from a poor family and it was really an absolute luxury to receive a book for me, myself, being so beautiful to, to, immerse, to being immersed in. So, yeah, that's a, a, a very important book for me. That's true. So that was obviously a very special experience for you and it had value to it. Do you think that the digital age that we're entering now, I mean, you talk a lot about e-books, it does, does, do, do young people today have that same experience of it being a, a valued and special experience to, 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 you know, to, to have a book and to read it? I, I think you know, what I see in, in, in my country at least is that the, the experience I actually had is being uh, repeated all over and all over again for each new generation. So reading with small children, uh, having them acquainted with the, the medium book, uh, and after that being uh, read stories to them and, uh, and when they begin, begin reading, they, they start reading, uh, as you, you were saying, the, the, the success of, of Harry Potter is enormous. So yes, young people are still reading and are, uh, a lot of people, not only young people, are, um, like to be immersed in a, in a story, which is something different than reading a book and thinking and, and reflecting on, on life. But, but yes, they, they read. Yeah. Sven, yeah, I'll pass it to Sven actually. And also, um, you know, because we talk about different new formats and new and emerging formats. So maybe you could expand on that idea as well. Well, my thought as I'm listening is that it plays two ways that in a sense, Narrative is, might be called a gateway drug, in a way. Uh, it's the seductive thing that brings people into also the realm of reading, um, narrative. But I also feel like it needs to be remarked that an enormous amount of narrative activity right now is being hijacked, in a sense, by um, 
online gaming, which is deeply narrative based and it's also being to some extent hijacked by the extreme popularity of things like Game of Thrones and so on. It, I, I, think, I don't think it can be the end point. I, I think it's the, uh, the lure, it's what brings us into a symbol processing world which then opens into deeper possibilities. I also, I wanted to just not lose the thread of the importance of the librarian and since we're speaking of personal memories and so on, the enormous difference, my first exposure I think to the idea of the librarian was watching the uh, film musical The Music Man with the figure of Marion the librarian and at least in America it became an established almost cultural cliche that the librarian was a somewhat prim lady with her hair in a bun and a pencil stuck back there. And the power of images to create deeper impressions is of a kind of strictness and conservatism represented by that. And I think everything we're talking about looking toward uh, future outcomes is that the librarian should be a sort of revolutionary sort of vanguard figure as opposed to a conservative figure. So I just wanted to throw that into the well, using your analogy from your talk earlier on um, about the, um, uh, you know, the, the vessel, the, the context, the jar, was it, I think, um, then the librarian becomes the guide through that, the guide to context, I guess. And, and in this sort of like world of, of exploding data, there is so much information coming at us from every different possible medium. Um, you know, both you and Davina spoke about the transformative nature of literature, right? I mean, Davina, would you say that, um, you know, I listen to audiobooks, unabridged, read by the author, and I remember, I first, I remember my first audiobook actually very clearly because I tried to read Bill Bryson's um, A Brief History of Everything, um, and I couldn't get my head around it, but then I read, I listened to the unabridged audiobook read by the author, and it all made sense. And now I tend to say, when speaking about literature that I've listened to an audiobook, I say, I have read so and so. Because in my mind, I kind of have read it. Do you think that that's a legitimate form of, of media? Do you think we can move on to legitimizing alternative forms of media where you don't actually have to read the words? I think we are in a period of wealth uh, and abundance, and it's good news. And you're behaving like a woman. <laughs> Meaning by that, that um, there's slightly cognitive dimensions uh, that are related to, to gender, and, and women um, are very susceptible to voice. And they, uh, hearing makes them understand in ways that men are more susceptible to image, whatever. I mean, I don't want to stereotype, but there are these things, and definitely it means that your kind of intelligence has been able to be touched by uh, that kind of uh, device that um, supports it. So why not? And it's, it's, been written about, it's been written about in psychology that, that visual, visually we retain more from pictures, right? So, uh, you know, manga mm -hmm. stories, comic books, 80% of our senses are visual, so what's new there? But it's true that the text-driven um, culture has had sort of uh, really made us over-muscular in that dimension of the text, uh, rather than taking uh, all the other dimensions of story. A story will stay with us forever. Uh, and that's why I maintain that uh, this idea of a shuttle screen, you know, there's, there is the screen of TV or audiovisual screen that provides the stories for all, not just the ones we write. Uh, and then there's the screen of the social networks that provides comments and conversations on that story, on those stories. That is the success of all these fantasy stories that young people are looking at. It's interesting uh, culturally at this time in life that they do that. We may say, oh, it's not serious books, it's not the classics. But I think that these books um, represent life as they see it in an extremely chaotic way. And in many ways, if you look at these books, we're back to Shakespeare. It's just incredible, the fights, the battles, the gore, the, the, the incredible political betrayals, etc., etc. Uh, and that's how young people experience the world today. It's not... A, classified view at all. So these fantasies represent that. And uh, they respond more to their expectations or their needs as a story 
that holds them together than maybe some of our classics. I think our challenge, and maybe the challenge for librarians, is after that to bring them to other types of books and back to the classics. Uh, but um, I think we shouldn't um, underestimate what their cultural readings are telling us about our culture. It's bleak in their eyes. It was interesting for me as well, um, hearing you talk, Davina, about the, the, you know, the, the heavy connection and relationship for young people between reading and actually creating content themselves. Um, you know, for, in my experience as a technology journalist, beyond, um, you know, this sort of like literary um, ideas, we are now in an age of mass customization, we call it. You know, people expect to be able to influence what they're consuming, what they're buying. They want to have some kind of part in its creation, be it you know, choosing the design of a shoe, um, you know, or, or choosing the camera angle of the, of, the, of the sporting event that they're watching. They want to be part of the creation process. Um, so, Klaus Peter, how can we bring that into the library? You know, that's such an integral part of young people's idea of, 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 of participating in the world. I think there are two ways um, to, to improve the, let's say, traditional services because a catalog can also be a platform for talking about books, not talking, not always by librarians, but by, by the audience who have read the books. So you can build up on traditional service um, a kind of um, social communication with your patrons. On the other side, uh, certainly you have to create programs for that. Um, and they have, we heard it from Divina, they, they have to be different from what we have done before. And um, that's the, the great demand to, to, to create also this public space of a library when I think of such launches and I, I come to my um, my mayor responsible for, for the budget and I say I want to have a launch area in my library uh, then I'm confronted again with this old tradition of an image of a library and that's my problem in, in, in creating, getting forward uh, and keeping space with what is happening in this world of information Yes, go ahead, Davina. I'd just, I just like to add to that because I think I might have scared you about the profile, the next profile of librarians. Um, what I was giving you as examples already exist. I haven't invented what was there and, and I be believe firmly in sharing experiences across libraries and I think that innovation uh, takes place that way. You, we can't ask librarians as they are now and as they are trained now, as you are now, to innovate incrementally from one to five. Nobody does that. But we can ask you to move from one to two by looking at other experiences and, and seeing what works for you and taking it. And I think that's doable if you're encouraged to do it, if there is a, a whole consensus around the community. I think that's doable. I, I'm very optimistic about what can happen. Yeah. Yes, I want to add something. We, in, in my country, we had a huge discussion uh, around the e-inclusion uh, uh, target or goal of, of public libraries. Uh, how to deal with uh, that challenge of e-inclusion when the, most of the people working in Flemish uh, libraries are uh, 53 years or older. Uh, I would say it's important to see public libraries also as a modest place. You, you shouldn't do everything at the same time. You shouldn't be Superman, uh, 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 challenging all the changes. You can also say uh, one of the most important things public libraries are doing is to facilitate what others are doing with their tools. And I think that's the first and uh, a very important modest level of ambition that every, almost everybody can, can, uh, can attain. The other uh, steps are, yes, you can partner with others and be building a network. You shouldn't do everything yourself, but they invite others to do it in your environment. So that's also a kind of facilitating. And if there's nobody else to do it, well, try to organize it yourself. But you have those steps of uh, reaching out of, for the new challenges of public libraries. So. 
Absolutely, thank you. Let's, uh, there's a, we'll come back to you in a moment, Sven, if that's okay. There's a lady in the front row who would like to participate. If you would introduce yourself first, please. Yes, my name is Erna Winters. I'm a director of Public Library in the Netherlands and um, former member of the EC of Ablida. Um, I think what we need to address are a few uh, topics. First, to get, uh, I'm, I'm very uh, glad with the uh, research that you did, Davina, because um, in, to my opinion, and uh, a lot of people of my age uh, uh, and uh, older and a bit younger think that young people know everything uh, uh, and they're very skilled at uh, using internet and, and social media and there's just been research in the Netherlands as well that's just not the case they have no idea what they're doing uh, but youngsters themselves have the impression that they know much more than their parents. Well, don't they always? I used to do as a, when I was a kid. So, uh, but as a, uh, in my uh, library, uh, we trained our staff uh, and we trained them very well and most of them are very willing to learn new stuff. Uh, but when we go to schools and try to bring the message across, we can help you, we can help your pupils and your teachers to become more digital literate. They just don't um, grant us that role. They think that we're old fashioned. And uh, so it's all about the image and, and keeping up the message of this is something that we need to address together and that we maybe want to learn together, together with the children and go on that path together and make, well, make the journey together. So, Fan, is it, is it a, a kind of a, a, a rebranding exercise in some ways? I mean, you're looking around the audience, I don't see a pencil in any buns going around the audience here, do I? <laughs> but yeah, what you wanted to, to comment on this as well. I have a somewhat different comment, though I completely agree with what you just said. Make sure you speak into the microphone. When we were looking for ways to broaden, open, and you know, revolutionize the library space, I had the thought that if we imagine it as a sort of emporium where milk is on offer, that we should bring the cows in as much as possible, and really to have libraries be a kind of ongoing, permanent welcome station for all people who, in fact, write and produce content and who enable the audience, the younger people in many cases, to see where, in fact, these experiences that they're consuming across whatever platform are originating from. And I know that requires budgets in many cases, but I think if a precedent were set that the library, that the library is a kind of open communal stop for people engaged in storytelling or any sort of um, interesting intellectual endeavor that that should be part of the constant flow of what happens in that space. And Davina, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, we did, was there somebody else in there? Yes, go ahead, Davina. Briefly, I wanted to answer you is, uh, yes, your misrepresentations work in all directions right now. And we have to try and be as explicit as possible, all of us, including young people. They all have a sense of expertise. That's something that we get from our research, too. They have a sense of expertise, which doesn't mean they have it. You see what I mean? But it's positive compared to other places at school where they are deprived of expertise, where they are put down, uh, it's a good thing, even if they don't know everything about it. So we have to share this sense of expertise, but they have to realize uh, librarians have it. Their image of librarians is that librarians don't have the expertise, that they are the ones who hook up the computer. And their image of, libra the image of librarians with teachers, for the teachers, they are a threat. In France, where librarians are also teachers, the, the two patterns that we see when they meet, the teachers and librarians meet, either the teacher takes over the library or the librarian takes over the library. Very few times do we have when it really works as a cluster. That cluster where I was saying is the teachers and it's a pedagogical team. This is still wishful thinking, even though we've put it in text, in law, in proficiency. So it's all, it's a huge work about representations, really. Well, one of the problems, you know, I, I speak in schools and uh, I speak to teachers quite a lot. Um, and one of the problems that teachers in IT and technology-based subjects have is that technology moves so quickly. 
um, and yet their training isn't able to keep up. Now, I just want to, the lady in the front row has pr proved that she, her arm works, but I'm just going to check the rest of you, that your arms are in full working order. So I'm going to put a question out there, and then I'll come to the questions in the audience. I would like to ask you, how many of you feel that you do not have enough training or opportunity to learn about these new disciplines that we're talking about in order to execute your role properly? Hands up. How many of you feel that you have enough? Okay, so some of you just aren't listening at all. <laughs> but okay, it's interesting though, isn't it? Because, you know, this is one of the problems with technology. And there's a gentleman there in a red tie. Um, if you would like to um, introduce yourself and um, make your comment or ask your question. Yeah. Uh, Guy Danes, uh, I work for the professional body for librarians in the UK. Um, I, I, I guess I've got really um, uh, 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 two points. Firstly, um, we've been s focusing um, quite a lot on school libraries and on public libraries, which I think is great. But I would actually want to make a special case for prison librarians who are right at the front line of literacy problems because um, the prison population, I think in virtually all European countries, um, is heavily... Uh, um, uh, skewed with, um, with people with literacy uh, 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 and other problems. And so the types of schemes that they are engaged in, and one that always brings tears to my eyes, is that prisoners are, for obvious reasons, isolated from their families and from their kids. And there are schemes, for instance, of getting prisoners to read stories onto tapes which are then sent to their kids so that they can share in storytelling um, through tapes. That in itself often brings to the fore the literacy problems that the prisoners themselves have. So it, um, it's not only in the obvious areas that um, librarians are, 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 are tackling literacy, it's in these specialist areas such as prison libraries which, uh, um, w w which some really great work is, is, is continuing. That's a very interesting point. And just, if you could hold the microphone, I'd like to ask you a, a, a further follow-on question for that. Because we were speaking about the fact that libraries don't really come into contact with people who, you know, the, the people who suffer from um, uh, illiteracy. So do you think there are lessons that, that the broader community can take? I would, I would challenge the assumption. I don't think my public library colleagues would say that they don't come into contact with people who have literacy problems. And I will tell you, for one thing, um, that's certainly not the case now, and it's going to, uh, and it certainly won't be the case in the future. Um, in my country, we have a thing, uh, a government policy called digital by default, which means if you want to get your welfare benefit, if you want to sign on, you have to do it um, uh, uh, via computer, by, uh, via term. If you, we've been speaking about digital literacy, uh, um, uh, and we've been obviously speaking about the, the base literacy of, of, of reading, if you lack those things, uh, where are you going to go um, if you need to money to uh, you know uh, need to get the money to eat and everything? They're all being directed to the public library at the moment in my country, and I can assure you they know very well about the types of digital literacy. Uh, and indeed information literacy and reading problems that, uh, uh, that, many, uh, um, that many in our society have. And actually, I, I always get shocked, really shocked and ashamed that, um, in my case, it's the UK, um, that 17% of adults don't even have a literacy level of an 11-year-old. What a shocking indictment of a, a, of a so-called developed nation. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh yeah, that was a key word for, for reaching the people who need such programs. I think there are only two, two good examples. Um, the one is um, Laserstart, which I mentioned, uh, with three milestones where, you, where we try to combine the different levels. That means first, the doctor um, with, for, for children with one year. The people are not um, obliged to go to them, but 95% uh, do it. So that's the first position, and then um, first step, and then the library, and then the school. It's a good combination. And then the second one is reading makes strong, um, where libraries are forced to search, to, to look for two partners. They can cannot and are not allowed to do it alone. They have to look for different partners in the community to, to create a stronger level to reach the people with such programs. 
Interesting. Um, OK, there's a ch gentleman in the sec third row back. Hi there. Martin Mullen, Better World Books, from the UK as well. So I absolutely share the endowment that Guy, Guy made. It strikes me that whilst we look to build a Europe of readers, there are two particular trends that we've talked about this morning. One is an increasingly techie group, and the other are the 75 million who are illiterate. What does the panel think are the opportunities and the impacts socially and economically? And having been to prisons, as Guy referred to in the previous question, recently we've seen that firsthand. Um, okay, this is our last question because we are um, really uh, running into time, but um, who would like to take that? Maybe Davina? I'm just in the process of starting that with um, um, not only people in prison, but people in camps uh, in the Palestine. Um, and um, the idea is to deliver books, but uh, under whichever format. And um, the, um, the amount of, uh, it's, again, it's a tear jerker, because the amount of expectation that um, the parents have for their kids to learn, even though they are in impossible situations. I'm looking at prisons for young people and uh, in different places. So Palestine, Portugal, uh, prisons in Portugal, um, camps, prisons in the Palestine. Um, and so we're just starting now, but the idea is to, to um, produce um, a literacy um, kit for them. Um, and uh, we don't care how it gets to them. If it gets in a paper format, computer format, um, we, we're just producing it so that uh, whatever their age of entry, uh, they can um, discover or rediscover the pleasure of, uh, of reading, um, starting from scratch. And one of the hypotheses is that um, you, it's sort of retro engineering about learning to, to read and write. Uh, we start orally, we start by making them tell their stories, then we move to digital storytelling, which uh, you know is sort of a very specific case and where it's a very constrained format where you ask people to choose a story they want to tell collectively, and then they have 10 pictures and 300 words. So this is a very dynamic format to produce something as a group. And from there, we elicit the urge to want to go on and to tell more stories and to learn to read these stories and not just have somebody be the secretary, etc. So it's a whole strategy to remove stress, to allow these people to talk about their stress and to go on. So, but it's just beginning. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have any results yet. Perfect. Well, we are, we are right out of time on this, and I realise that we're the only thing standing between you and your lunch now, so I'm going to wrap up really quickly. But I'm sure that my panellists will be more than happy to continue the discussion during the networking sessions um, through lunch and through uh, the coffee breaks uh, this afternoon. Um, but I would like to thank everybody. Thank you very much for your participation and um, for getting those arms working. And thank you, of course, to my panel, to Sven, to Jan, to Davina, and to Klaus Peter for their brilliant contributions both this morning and through the discussion um, and I look forward to chatting to you a little bit later on with a proper summary of the events of today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and thank you all the panelists. I think it was really exciting. Uh, you, you, you probably are aware that we are a bit off the time and uh, therefore we propose so you have time for proper lunch. Uh, Let's resume with workshops on 2 o'clock, so move it 15 minutes. So, uh, regarding the workshops, uh, those who are looking for NAPL workshop, uh, you have to look for room number 122, which is exactly directly opposite of the entrance, so the big glass room. And, uh, and I believe the workshop is also on the first floor here, uh, a room called Jura. It's C, uh, very romantic. And uh, so let's meet there at 2 o'clock. And there are a couple of people who, during the registration, didn't take their dinner cards for, for tonight's dinner. So make sure to visit the registration room and, and get your dinner cards.